Mr. President, the report uh, this week about the uh, rate of poverty in America is an eye-opener. The numbers that have um, been reported are stunning. The number of Americans living in poverty now stands at $46.2 million. That's part 46.2 million people. That's an increase of 8.9 million since 2007, just in four years. This has increased significantly since the year 2000. The poverty threshold, incidentally, for a mother and father with two children is an annual income of $22,000 a year. That's less than $2,000 a month. <clears throat> so for that family of four, what we're saying is 46 million Americans make less than that. I think all of us understand how difficult it is in this day and age to survive and raise a family. But this national poverty rate should be a wake-up call to us. And I hope it puts a couple things in perspective. I spoke on the floor yesterday about visiting a warehouse in Champaign, Illinois for the food depositories in the area. It's a warehouse where they process and send out food for food pantries that are managed by local groups, churches, and the like. Almost every state has them. I'm sure they do. And I was in this warehouse during the August recess to talk about the increased volume of people who are going to food pantries on a regular basis. I visit these food pantries to introduce myself to those who are coming in and to learn as much as they want to tell me about their circumstances. Well, at this warehouse in Champaign, Illinois, was a woman who was uh, very attractive and well-dressed and standing there, and I assumed she worked at the warehouse, and it turned out I was wrong because she said at one point she was a teacher's aide in the local school district. And I thought, why is she here? I kept thinking to myself, I wonder why this woman is here. Maybe she's on the board of this food depository. Well, it turns out she was there to tell me her story. She's a single mom with two young children. She has a full-time job as a teacher's aide in the school district. And because her income is below the poverty level, she qualifies for not only food stamps, but also uses these food pantries. And she said to me, she wanted to express her gratitude that we now have extended these, the SNAP program, food stamp program, to include fresh produce, uh, fruits and vegetables. And she said, it means I can take my kids to the local farmer's market and they get to meet the farmers and they get to ask questions and hear stories about where these things come from, the fruits and vegetables that we buy, and she says, I get to buy healthy food to give my kids. It was an eye-opener because I never would have picked her out of the crowd as a person who needed help to feed her children, and she did. And she told me without this, I would be struggling. It's an eye-opener too, I hope, for all of America. When you hear that 46 million of us are in, living in poverty, these are our neighbors, our friends, the people we go to church with, these are folks you may see in the store, and they're people who are struggling, many of them working, but not making enough money. Some have full-time jobs, many have part-time jobs. And it's a reminder as we get into this deficit debate, never to lose sight of the safety net in America. We are a kind and caring people. We've proven that over many generations. Uh, we do things that many other countries don't do, for one thing, we have our young men and women volunteer to risk their lives in foreign lands to try to bring peace. In addition to that, we've been engaged for over a century in helping other countries that are struggling. I just received a handwritten letter from two grade school children in Illinois about those who were starving in Somalia. It was a heartfelt letter asking me to do something. Not unusual, it's a sentiment expressed over and over again in our country. We need to have the same empathy and the same compassion for our own in America. And what that means is not only saying good things and perhaps helping through our churches and other charities, but also making certain that the safety net programs in our country are there for those who are struggling. We're engaged in a mighty debate now about deficit reduction. I've been part of it for a little while in, in some capacities. And I keep reminding those who are in the debate that there are some programs that are absolutely essential. Some of them are obvious. The food stamp program to make sure that the lady I mentioned and others like her have enough food for their children. The Medicaid program, 
which provides health insurance for one-third of America's children. In Illinois, pays for over 50% of the births and takes care of our elderly when they're in the nursing home and run out of their savings. So as we talk about deficit reduction, let us focus on making certain at the end of the day the safety net is still in place. Let us make sure that the child care deductions that we have in the tax code are there for working families. The earned income tax credit, a program started under President Reagan, which acknowledges that many people who are working still need a helping hand in our tax code. Medicaid that I mentioned earlier, the food stamp program, housing programs for those who are homeless and need a helping hand. The safety net has to be honored and has to be preserved in the course of our deficit, uh, uh, deficit debate. But I would also say at this point, the president has really challenged us to stop giving speeches and to start moving forward on getting America back to work. He's made a proposal in last Thursday's uh, joint session of Congress to give working families across America a payroll tax cut. What would it mean in Illinois? The average uh, income in Illinois is about $53,000 a year, and the president's payroll tax cut would be worth $1,400 to every family making that amount of money. That's $120 a month. It may not sound like much to people who are wealthy, but for those who are struggling paycheck to paycheck, it could make a difference. President Obama wants to give more income security to middle income families. That's what his proposal is about. And he's turned around and said when it comes to small businesses, let us give them incentives to hire the unemployed. The only line the president delivered a week ago that I remember got a standing ovation from both sides is when the president said, let's incentivize employers to hire our veterans. Everybody stood up. We know that's the right thing. They served our country, they came home, we ought to give them a hand to help. That's part of the president's plan. But he went beyond it and said if people have been unemployed and an employer is willing to hire them, let us give them a tax credit to do it. So the president is moving tax benefits to small businesses, the so-called job creators that we hear so much about, and I believe they are, as well as to working families. But it's all paid for. And this is where many Republicans take exception. How does the president pay for getting America back to work? He asks for sacrifice from the wealthiest people in America. There are some members of the Republican Party who would not impose one penny more in taxes on the wealthiest people in America. They are prepared to see every other family sacrifice except for those who can sacrifice without feeling any pain in their lives. I don't think that's fair and I think the president's right. Those who are making the highest incomes in America should join with every other family in America and help us get beyond this recession. And also, the president starts eliminating the subsidies the federal subsidies for oil companies. I don't have to remind Americans what the price of gasoline is. They know it. In Illinois, it's over $4 a gallon, many places that I travel to during the recess. And these oil companies are witnessing the highest profits in the history of American business. The president has said, and I agree, it's time to cut the federal subsidy, the tax subsidy for oil companies, these profitable companies that make so much money for their shareholders and give so many bonuses to their, their officers. So many Republicans object to this. They don't want to raise taxes on the oil companies. They don't want to raise taxes on the wealthiest people in America. I just think that they ought to put it in perspective. If we can help middle income and working families get through the recession, stop living paycheck to paycheck and have a little bit of a cushion in their lives, if we can give small businesses an incentive to hire Americans and turn this economy around, that's what America needs. Let's get beyond the rhetoric that has stalled efforts in Washington. Let's get beyond the obstructionism and the obstacles. Let us finally work together with the president's leadership and come up with a plan to put America back to work.